Good morning. Welcome again to the Bethany Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church as we gather together to worship the Lord our God and to give thanks for his many manifold mercies and graces unto his saints. And as we begin this morning, just a few announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, for those of you who may not have heard, uh, uh, Miss Pat Jones went to be with the Lord on Friday evening. And uh, the service uh, will be Thursday at 1045 uh, here in the sanctuary with uh, burial service out in the cemetery uh, to follow. Uh, one thing the family has asked is if you will be coming to that service, uh, please uh, bring a mask uh, for the uh, indoor service. Uh, please continue also to keep uh, Bonnie Lee and, and the Jones family in your prayers uh, this week. And we give thanks to the Lord for the promise we have in the resurrection uh, from the dead and the goodness uh, that he has shown unto his people. Uh, well, a couple other announcements. First of all, as you see in the bulletin, uh, the uh, session has had to make the regretful decision to postpone homecoming for this year uh, due to uh, all the uncertainties. And uh, so please be on the lookout. Uh, we may uh, try and reschedule that for this year, but like I said, just keep an eye out for that. Uh, one other thing uh, in uh, the bulletin uh, that you see there, uh, as we continue to make decisions going forward, please continue to keep the elders uh, and myself in prayer as we make uh, the decision. Again, I want to uh, express if you all have any uh, thoughts, ideas, or anything, we're more than welcome uh, to receive uh, those uh, things. So just again, continue to keep uh, the, the session and the elders in prayer. And let us now prepare ourselves for worship as we come before the Lord through a moment of silent prayer. Amen. Our call to worship this morning comes to us from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 29, beginning at verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord again as we are called to worship by the word of the living and the true God. Again, from Deuteronomy, chapter 29, at verse 10. All of you stand today before the Lord your God, your leaders and your tribes and your elders and your officers, all the men of Israel your little ones and your wives, also the stranger who is in your camp, from the one who cuts your wood to the one who draws your water, that you may enter into covenant with the Lord your God and into his oath, which the Lord your God makes with you today, that he may establish you today as a people for himself, and that he may be God to you, just as he has spoken to you, just as he has sworn to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. As we hear these words of Holy Scripture this morning and are reminded of the covenant that God has made with us, that He is our God and that we are His people, let us return our thanks unto the Lord for this gracious gift uh, by standing uh, for our opening Bible song uh, from your green uh, Bible song books uh, as we sing uh, Bible song number 177, Psalm 85, the Lord's salvation. Let us stand and let us rejoice together.
the Lord our God and of the blessings that he has bestowed upon us uh, through our glorious Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us come now before this selfsame God as we lift up our prayers unto the heavens and in our opening prayer. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, the God of heaven and the God of earth, and the King of kings and the Lord of lords, whom has made and given this glorious Sabbath day, that we might rest from our worldly labors, and we might take up the rest that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Unto you we bring our hearts and our souls and our minds and all of our being this day. For dear God, you are the one who has created uh, not only uh, this earth, but you have given unto your people uh, new hearts and new lives. You have made us new creatures in your Son, for you have given unto us the blessings of your grace. And you have showered upon us daily the remembrance of that great and glorious covenant, uh, that we might live in light of your blessing. And we might look forward to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, where we will see the enemies of the church, the enemies of Christ himself, uh, thrown down into the lake. And that we might go forth unto the heavens themselves forever and ever, glorifying your name. And dear God, as we gain a foretaste of that victory today uh, through our worship and through the presence of your Holy Spirit, to God, we come together now saying the words that your Son taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue to worship the Lord our God, we do so by turning once more to Holy Scripture. As we read uh, from 2 Samuel uh, chapter 5 as we uh, continue to read uh, through this book. And as we see uh, the establishment and the uh, place of David's uh, kingdom uh, during this time. Again, 2 Samuel chapter 5, beginning there at verse 17. Hear the word of the Lord. Now when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. And David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. The Philistines also went and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. So David went to baal Perazim, and David defeated them there. And he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breakthrough of water. There he called the name of the place baal Perazim, And they left their images there, and David and his men carried them away. Then the Philistines went up once again and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Therefore David inquired of the Lord. And the Lord said, You should not go up. Circle around behind them and come upon them in front of the mulberry trees. And it shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, then you shall advance quickly. For then the Lord will go out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord commanded him. And he drove back the Philistines from Geba as far as Gezer. Amen. Thanks be again to the reading of God's holy and perfect word. Let us now, as we continue to worship uh, the Lord our God, turn to our red uh, hymnals as we sing together hymn number 562. Let us again rejoice in the name of the Lord our God. Again, hymn number 562.
seated. So we come now in our uh, time of worship this morning to bring the needs of our church, the needs of our community, the needs of the Lord's people unto him. Let us prepare ourselves as we come into the presence of our holy and our righteous God. Let us pray. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of grace and the God of love, the God of mercy and the God of righteousness and holiness, unto you we gather together on this glorious day, on this day where we can bring before you the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ. <laughs> The time in which you have called your people to be with not only you, but with all of your covenant people gathered here today as well as gathered throughout the world on this day that you have declared holy. We might show forth to the world around us that we love the Lord our God, that we testify to our dependence upon you. That you are the one who alone is worthy of worship. Dear God, as we do come together today and as we uh, are reminded uh, through the witness of your holiness of our own sin. Dear God, we do gather together confessing our sin before you. Confessing that we have transgressed your holy law. But dear God, most especially that uh, we have turned aside to idols. That we have turned aside to the material things of this world uh, for our hope and for our peace. And gracious Heavenly Father, dear God, as we uh, come before you and confess these sins, not only individually, but as uh, the Bethany Church. Dear God, we pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you will not only remind us of the forgiveness of sins. But dear God, that you would give us an assurance of that forgiveness through the power of your Holy Spirit and the remembrance of the great work of the great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our advocate and who is the, our mediator, and who is the one who intercedes for us daily. And dear God, again, we confess that far too often when we think upon our sins, dear God, we look for those things in this world to provide atonement for us provide, again, uh, to assuage the guilt that we feel. Dear God, we again turn unto you. Dear God, that through the means of your grace, uh, through the reading of your word, uh, through prayer, dear God, that you would again remind us of the feeble nature of the idols made with the hands of men. For they cannot give what they promise. And they only have the power of the creator that made them. God, we pray that you would open our eyes to see uh, those things that we use as idols. God, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to enlighten our hearts, dear God, that we might have the strength to put those idols out of our lives. Dear God, we might be honest, not only with ourselves, but dear God, honest with you. Dear God, may you again grant us the strength uh, to uh, not only be sanctified by your Spirit, Dear God, to remove uh, those groves uh, from our homes and from our lives. So again, dear God, we pray that you would strengthen us by uh, the work uh, that you have accomplished through your Son and the work that you are accomplishing through the Holy Spirit. Dear God, we pray that as we rest and trust in the, in the peace that you've granted through your Son, Dear God, we might go forth out of our homes and out of this place this morning, rejoicing in the forgiveness of sins, rejoicing in the salvation uh, that you have gifted and granted unto your people uh, by the certainty of your name. Dear God, you are the God of Moses, and you are the God of Paul, and you are the God of all the saints who have gone before. 
God, as we read of their witness and as we see their perseverance in the face of the enemies of the gospel. God, we pray that we would likewise stand bold in the face of so much that is attempting to destroy your church, attempting to put your truth to a lie. Dear God, may we learn to love your word. May we learn to meditate upon Holy Scripture. Dear God, when uh, this present evil age uh, tries and lead us astray, that we might stand fast in the witness of your truth. Dear God, we pray as we learn your word more and more, dear God, that uh, you would open our eyes to see how so much of what we take in is intended uh, to drive a wedge between you and us. Dear God, may we love you more than we love this present evil world. May it not be said of us like it was said of uh, so many companions of the Apostle Paul that they love this present evil world more than they love the gospel of Jesus Christ. Dear God, we pray especially this morning for those who have wandered away from the faith. Dear God, we lift up to those who are, uh, who are backsliding, who are uh, turning aside to idols. Dear God, we pray for them. God, we pray for those who are fighting these spiritual battles. God, we pray that you would uh, lead them back into the house of the Lord. Dear God, we pray as we have conversations with those who are in this place, dear God, that we would season our words with grace. Dear God, that we uh, would uh, long to see them reunited with you, not for the sake of the Bethany Church, but for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, we pray that you would give us opportunity uh, to share the gospel uh, with those who are wandering, uh, that they would be reminded of the beauty of the testimony of your Son. And to God, as we pray these particular prayers uh, uh, for those who claim the name of Christ, to God, we especially pray for the opportunities you provide for us to witness your truth unto unbelievers. To God, may we uh, speak your word boldly. For to God, while you've not called each of us to be Preachers, and you've not called each of us to be elders, dear God. You've called each of us to be witnesses, not only in the words that we use, but in the lives that we lead. Dear God, may people know that we're Christians. May people be able to see the difference in the way that we live, in the way that we order our lives. Dear God, that nothing uh, would get in the way of our service to you. Dear God, may we live a life of thanksgiving for this manifold grace. Dear God, as we continue to pray for the needs of the Bethany Church, dear God, we uh, do lift up unto you the Lee and the Jones families this morning. God, we pray that you would comfort them in the peace and the hope of the resurrection. Dear God, that you would grant unto them a sure knowledge of your truth. Dear God, we pray uh, for the opportunities that we have to minister to them. Dear God, may they hear the words of Christ. We speak unto them. God, we pray also for those who are in the hospital, those who are homebound, those who are struggling with physical ailments. God, we pray in your mercy that you would bring healing unto them. God, that they might feel and know the comforting of your presence. God, that they might again know that even though they might be separate from us this morning, dear God, they are united to us through the work of Jesus Christ. And that through Christ, dear God, we are present and with them. Dear God, may they know again uh, that we uh, dearly love them. Dear God, may you grant them again the comfort of your peace. Dear God, as we continue to lift up this sin-soaked world uh, that we see on the news and read on the internet and, and see witnessed uh, from day to day. Dear God, we pray earnestly for the work of the gospel. We pray for that pouring of the Holy Spirit at this time. To God, as we see your judgment coming down upon our land, as we see your judgment coming down upon the world, dear God, may you grant us repentance. May you grant us repentance not only as individuals, but repentance as a nation and as a world that has turned its back on you. Dear God, may you again use the gospel, for it alone is uh, the answer for the trials and tribulations. For only in your law can we find justice, and only in your law can we find peace. Dear God, as we pray for 
uh, these uh, particular things and as we continue to pray uh, for uh, the uh, coronavirus and everything that's going on related to it. Dear God, may uh, we be lovers of truth. Dear God, may you give us uh, not only wisdom uh, and compassion, but dear God, may you help us to know what is the truth and, and what it is that we should be doing. Dear God, we confess that so much uh, that we take in is laced with misinformation whether intentionally or not, but there is uh, just so much out there, dear God, and we confess that we are overwhelmed with it. You know, we pray again that you would give us eyes to see uh, the right and the good. Dear God, as we come before you again in worship this morning, and as we long to be with you in the heavenly places, God, we pray that you will watch over us as we walk by faith and not by sight. And that, dear God, as we go from this place this morning and as we go back out into this uh, evil world, that you will protect us, that you will guide us, and show us your truth. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as we come uh, to the reading of God's word uh, once more. We come to our sermon text this morning from Matthew chapter 4. Uh, please stand again as we read the word of God uh, from Matthew chapter 4, beginning there at verse 17. In the word of the Lord given uh, by the hand of the living God. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers. Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they are fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left the boat, and their father, and followed him. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, you've given us these words on this day by your providence. And dear God, we pray uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit that you will open our hearts and our minds to receive your truth. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. As we began uh, this uh, summer sermon series uh, last week, uh, asking the question, what does it mean to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? We started last week with the calling of Matthew. And we saw in the calling of Matthew this man who was a tax collector, who was a thief, who was a customs official, one in which the other apostles probably did not like very much and had uh, some uh, personal animosity against, we saw as the Lord Jesus went to Matthew, called him not just to follow him, but also called him to repentance. And we saw as Matthew left his table and came and follow Jesus Christ. And one of the things we talked about last week was is there's some similarities between the calling of Matthew and the calling of Zacchaeus. And of course we know the story of Zacchaeus very well. And I know many of you learned the Zacchaeus song when you were a child. And you know, some of us can identify with Zacchaeus fairly well uh, when it comes to his stature. And some of us probably would have likewise had to climb up the tree uh, to see Jesus as he walked by. But you remember something about the Zacchaeus story that applies to Matthew. When Zacchaeus saw the Lord Jesus Christ, and when Zacchaeus was converted by the grace of the Lord God, what did he do? He didn't just invite Jesus into his home. Lots of people invited Jesus into his home. There was something else that took place in the calling story of Zacchaeus. You remember there that he testified to Christ that he gave back what he stole. And he gave back what he stole in accordance with the law of Moses. And that's one something that's important to remember about how Zacchaeus and, of course, how the Lord Jesus understood repentance. 
God had already granted a pattern to follow when it came to turning away from sin and living a life of righteousness. He had given the laws of Moses. He had given unto the people a witness of how they were to go about changing the way that they lived. And of course, Zacchaeus there, as he gives back twofold, fourfold what he stole, as I noted, is a direct requirement of the Mosaic law. And Jesus there commends Zacchaeus for that work. Just as when Jesus went about healing, you remember he uh, almost always uh, told those whom he healed to go and to uh, wash. Right? Go and see the priest. And the point of that was not that Jesus was, uh, had come to continue the ceremonial law. Now, his purpose there wasn't that when we repent, we need to go see the Levite priest. His point was, again, to show them that something had to follow the healing. Something had to follow the confession of sin and the outward work of conversion. That there had to be a light that came out of the darkness. Now again, this is not saying that we have works that we have to do in order to be saved. Now, we're not saying that once you're converted, right, you get in by grace and stay in by works. Right? That's not the point of that. The, the point is, is that in these conversion stories that we see in the New Testament, uh, that we see in the Old Testament, that matter are always followed with examples of a changed life. And a life that seeks to be obedient to the law of the Lord. And it's a change of life which comes at a price. It comes at a cost. You know, when Matthew came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he had to leave his job. He couldn't continue to be an ungodly tax collector. Again, not that being a tax collector was what was ungodly, but his activities as a tax collector was what was out of accord with Holy Scripture. And so he had to give up his employment. Likewise, think of Zacchaeus. What did he have to give up? Now think about having to repay a debt four times of what you owe. Let's say you have a, I'm going to do easy math here. Let, let's say you have a car that you owe $10,000 and you pay back the $10,000. Well, the bank wants four times of that, right? And so you have to pay back $40,000. Now, how many of you have $40,000 laying around that you can pay for a $10,000 car? Right? That, that's quite a sacrifice that Zacchaeus had to make in real life in order to, Again, not just to show his repentance, but in order to leave all that he had in order to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there is a consequence that comes with this new life. And it's something that is shown in, like I said, in reality. And that's something we see here in the calling of the fishermen in Matthew chapter 4. Alike we saw again with not only with Zacchaeus but with Matthew here in the calling of these brothers of Peter and of Andrew and of James and of John. We see these men engaged in their worldly activity. You know, now unlike Zacchaeus and Matthew uh, there was nothing really sinful going on in the lifestyle of Peter and Andrew and James and John. Right? They were fishermen. But we also see something in the other telling of the calling of Peter and of Andrew and of, of John and his brother in the Gospel of Luke. You remember there in that calling that, that Luke gives us, we have the story of, uh, of them being out fishing and they're not catching anything. And you remember, what does Jesus have them do? Right? Jesus has them go back out onto the lake and he has them throw their net into the water. Right? And you remember what happened. After he throws the net in the water, they pull up more fish than they can possibly uh, ever remember catching in the history of their life. And remember what Peter does in Luke chapter 5 when he sees this abundance of fish. In Luke chapter 5, uh, verse 8, 
he says, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Right? There is an action that follows the witness of Christ unto uh, Simon Peter. He recognizes not only that he's seen a miracle, but remember what he says here about what he saw. Again, he testifies that Jesus Christ is the Lord. And that's not a word that a first century Jew would have gotten thrown around uh, without meaning. You know, it's interesting, the first uh, being in the Bible that recognizes who Jesus is was a demon. And remember, what did, Je what did the demon refer to Jesus as? Right? He referred to Jesus in a similar way. Right? He recognized his divinity. The fact that he was not just a superman or some kind of superhero, but he was God incarnate. And here Peter is recognizing this from the beginning. And of course we testify that Peter recognizes this not because he's smarter than everyone else, not because he's putting the context clues together, but because the Holy Spirit has opened his heart and his mind to make him aware of these things. Remember when Jesus later on in the Gospel of Matthew will be speaking to Peter and the disciples about who people say that he is, you remember it's Peter that confesses again that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Remember what Jesus says to them. Right? Flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but what? Right? My Father in heaven. Right? The Holy Spirit has revealed this to you, Peter. He has opened your eyes and your heart to see these things. And so what we see here in the calling of Peter, as we did with Zacchaeus and Matthew, is we see again a recognition of what has taken place in the conversion and the response that is required of those who come to faith, right? This recognition that Jesus Christ is Lord, this recognition that they are sinners, and that they are unworthy of being in the presence of God Almighty because of their sins. And Peter here again in Luke chapter 5, verse 8, again, one time Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And again, for he and all who were with them were astonished to catch a fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. And you notice here what Jesus says in response to Peter's shouting of his unworthiness. Of the fact that he is a sinner and he cannot be in the presence of a holy God. Jesus looks down at Simon and says, do not be afraid. And what does he mean by that? What does he mean when he tells them not to be afraid? Well, think about it again in the context here. Peter thinks himself a gross idolater sinner, which of course he is a gross idolater sinner. He is unworthy. To be in the presence of God Almighty. So why does Jesus then say to him, do not be afraid? Because what does Jesus know that Peter doesn't know? What is Jesus here to do? What is the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ? The mission of the Lord Jesus Christ is to die for Peter. To lay down his life for sinners such as Peter. Men and women unworthy of such a gift, such a grant of faith, such a beautiful work as is redemption. Now Peter again, he, he, again he's, he's, from what we can understand, is a somewhat faithful Jew. He probably went to synagogue almost every Saturday, if not every Saturday. And he, he remembers the word of God being read to him as, he, as a child, as a young man. And he, he may have understood a little bit about uh, what the Messiah was come to do. But of course, at this point in time, he doesn't fully understand. And of course, it takes Peter a good while to really understand what's going on. But again, Jesus has compassion upon Peter. And he tells, them, tells him, do not be afraid. 
From now on, you will catch men. Now again, think about the situation. Peter has been spending his entire adult life, probably all of his life, fishing. And Jesus Christ comes to him, shows him this mighty work. He confesses his sin before him, and then he repeats uh, to Peter, from now on you will catch men. Again, think about what must have been going through the mind of Peter at this point. What, what in the world does he mean by this? Right? What, what does he mean, I'm going to go catch men? And sometimes we uh, read a little bit too much into the Bible. We give the uh, people in the Bible almost somewhat too much credit because we know the rest of the story. Of course, Peter, at this point in time, in Luke 5 and in Matthew 4, doesn't know what's going to happen in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, right? It hasn't happened to him yet. And so he's thinking about what Jesus is talking about here. Again, from now on, you will catch men. Now, Peter very could have easily said, boy, this, this, this guy's just, what in the world? Uh, I, I'm not a slaver, right? I'm not going to go around kidnapping people. Right? I'm not going to catch men. Right? I don't work for the government. I'm, I'm not going to do these things. But notice what Peter does. Right? He doesn't say what some of us may have said and walked away saying, boy, this, this guy just doesn't have his head screwed on right. What does he do? What does it tell us he does in Luke 5 and Matthew 4? It says they immediately left their nets and followed him. Now why does Peter give up everything that he has? The, the Luke 5 kind of gives us information that you know, that, that Peter is not in charge of a small operation. Right? Luke chapter 5 tells us that he was partners with James and John. Now, if you're partners with somebody, that means you have more than one boat. That means you have more uh, than two boats. Right? It means you're in charge probably of a small fishing company of some kind. And Peter having seen the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, had confessed his sin before him, having received the compassion of Jesus Christ, leaves all of that and goes and follows this man who tells him that he is going to go and catch men. Now again, why does he do this? Why does he leave everything that he has in order to follow the Lord Jesus Christ? Because what did Jesus say to him? He told him, do not be afraid. And we see in the confession that Peter understands that if the Lord God calls you to do something, what should you do? You should leave all things and follow him. Now, again, most of us are not fishermen at the Lake of Galilee. Matter of fact, I don't want to pr pr you know, presume anything, but I'm pretty sure none of us are fishermen at the Lake of Galilee. None of us are, again, presuming, none of us are tax collectors. None of us are giving up $40,000 in order to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But what, again, do the scriptures call all men to do? When Jesus Christ calls us into his kingdom, what is the requirement of Holy Scripture? We are to forsake all things and follow him. And that, again, doesn't mean that we leave our jobs. It doesn't mean that we go off to a commune somewhere. It doesn't mean that we you know, go and do these things. The testimony, the witness here, is that those who have come to true faith in Jesus Christ are going to abandon all of those things that have, that, that have brought them into the situation where they need to be in repentance. That those who have truly come to faith will toss out the idols of their lives. And again, this isn't a New Testament witness. We see the same thing happen in the life of one of the most wicked kings of the Old Testament. Now, if you were going to rank all the wicked kings of the Old Testament, you know, you'd put Ahab up near the top, right? You'd put a Jehoram up there. And one who would probably go near the top of that list would have been Manasseh. Manasseh was one of the kings who not only had carried on the sins of his father Jeroboam, but Manasseh was one who had taken it a step further. 
And he had continued in the sins of Ahab and had actually made Ahab look like an Adam. It looked like somebody who wasn't even trying to sin before the Lord. Manasseh had thrown his own children into the fires of Molech. He had thrown his own children to sacrifice them in order to uh, gain something from this false god. And not only did he do it himself, but he led all of Israel into that sea. You know, there's a, a truism in the Bible that those who are in authority are going to be held account for how they led. Right? That goes not just for kings, it also goes for elders and ministers. The, the, uh, Paul in the book of Hebrews says that ministers are going to have to give an account for every word that they spoke. And the reason for that is, is because right, ministers have a unique responsibility to preach the truth. And if a minister is teaching falsely, they're not just leading themselves astray, but what are they doing? Right? They're leading an entire congregation astray. Leading them away from the Lord Jesus Christ and into the hands of the devil. And that's what Manasseh was doing, right? He was leading a whole nation into destruction. And sure enough, we see in 2 Chronicles 33 that that's what happens to Manasseh. He leads the entire nation of Israel into judgment before the Lord. In 2 Chronicles 3, verse 10, it says, And the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they would not listen. Therefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze fetters, and carried him off to Babylon. Now again, this is what Manasseh deserved. Matter of fact, Manasseh were, deserved far more than just being carried off in bronze fetters, right? Manasseh deserved the very hand of God's judgment upon his heart, the destruction that was due unto him, that had happened to Ahab and to Jezebel. But of course, this isn't the end of the story for Manasseh. What we see happen is, is when God brings him into this affliction in Babylon, in verse 12, it says, Now when he was in affliction, he implored the Lord his God heard his supplication and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. After this, he built a wall outside the city of David on the west side of Gihon in the valley, as far as the entrance of the fish gate. And then they closed Ophel, and he raised it to a very great height. And he put military captains in all the fortified cities of Judah. And in verse 15, he took away the foreign gods and the idols from the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built from the mouth of the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, and he cast them out of the city. He repaired the altar of the Lord, sacrificed peace offerings and thank offerings on it, and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. Right, this man who was far more wicked than Ahab, far more wicked than any of the other kings, what did the Lord God do for him? Right, the Lord God could have destroyed him and should have destroyed him, but the Lord had mercy upon him in carrying him in fetters to Babylon. And in the midst of that mercy, what happens to Manasseh? We see Manasseh. Come on to the Lord God. As it says there, he entreated and implored the Lord God. And in, most importantly in verse 12, notice what it says. He humbled himself greatly before the Lord God of his fathers. And again, this is the, 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 the central thing that we see in the calling stories of the New Testament and the Old Testament. It's this humbling oneself before the Lord our God. It's this testifying of who we are and who God is. Again, remember what Peter did when he saw the witness of the Lord God, right? He falls down on his face and says, I am a sinful man, O Lord. Right? We, he can hear Peter saying, depart from me. I am not worthy to be in your presence. But again, what does he say? Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. And this is what we see again from Manasseh. Right? The Lord hears his cries. The Lord brings him back into the land. And Manasseh removes all of the idols, removes the groves, removes all the things 
uh, that had led the people of Judah astray. And Manasseh makes sure not only that he takes care of his own sins, but remember what he says there. It says that he commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. And of course, this is what the Holy Spirit means uh, when uh, he has uh, Matthew write uh, Jesus' words about uh, Peter being a fisher of men. Because again, that this salvation that he has brought to the heart of Peter is going to show itself out not just in his personal life, but in the fact that Peter is an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what are we going to see from Peter? We're going to see from Peter a man who goes out and proclaims Christ and him crucified to the nations. We're going to see a man, Peter, who goes out and regardless of what the world believes of him, preaches boldly the word of Christ. Now, again, we know Peter and we know that he stumbles greatly, not just in the Gospels, but also in the letters of Paul. And we also hear Peter confess his own sin in his epistles. This man who uh, denied Christ three times wept when he was convicted by the Holy Spirit. This man who uh, tried to, uh, to, to, to kind of uh, jump out of the way when the Jews came up to Antioch. When confronted by Paul, he humbled himself and sought repentance for his sin. Now, this calling of Peter, again, is not only a reminder of the nature of God's work and salvation, uh, that when the Lord Jesus Christ speaks his words of peace and faith unto his children, they hear their master's voice. But we also see that it has an effect in his life, that he leaves all to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, that he goes out from here of being obedient to that call that Christ has placed on him. That he would be a fisher of men. Now again, not all of us are called to be fishers of men. The Apostle Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about the fact that we are a body. And that every part of the body has a purpose in Christ's kingdom. And my, my purpose may be to be the mouth. Right? To speak. In the name of Christ. Your purpose might be to be a foot or a hand. To be an ear. To be uh, whatever. And what does Paul say there about the body? Does that make me more important than you? Does that make Peter more important than the other disciples? Does that make Peter more important than those who will hear his preaching? Well, again, the witness of the New Testament is that in no place does Peter understand himself. To be more important than anyone else. That's one of the abominations uh, that, that we've seen in church history is an attempt to make Peter more important than anyone else. But Peter never understood himself in that way. And that's because, again, uh, we see in the testimony here. Peter, yes, he's been called to be an apostle. But what have each one of us been called to do? Each one of us has been called, if we are truly saved by the living and true God, to show that salvation not only in the life that we lead, but in the purposes that we go out to do. If we are a father, and we have been called by the Lord Jesus Christ to be a father, then we are to be the head of the household. We are to lead our children well. We are to lead our wives well. We are to love our wives as Christ has loved the church. And if we're not doing that, it's not because we don't understand the Bible. It may be because we do not know Jesus. Because again, the witness of Scripture is, is that salvation results in a changed life. It results in those who leave all of the idols of this age and follow what the Holy Scriptures teach you. This goes for mothers, this goes for children, it goes for all of us. Whatever role God has placed you in in his kingdom, we must find the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the rules, the laws for how we are to be a mother, how we are to be a father, how we are to be a husband and a wife, not in what the culture understands, but in what Holy Scripture has laid out. For these callings in life. Because again. 
What are we to do? What did Manasseh do after the Lord called him to salvation? Did he come back to Judah and remain in his former manner of life? When he came back to Judah, did he get rid of some of the groves and leave the rest of the groves standing because they were pretty? No, he got rid of all of them and he reordered his life as well as the life of Judah around what? Around serving the Lord God of Israel. You know, that's part of the reason why the church is so weak in our day. Because we've allowed the culture around us to set the standard for what is right and what is wrong. And then we judge everything based on the world around us. You know, the church is called to be different from the world. You know, the church is called to be set apart from the world. And part of that set-apartness is not merely so that uh, we would be a light unto the nations, though that's part of it, right? That's part of what God had called Israel to in Deuteronomy, that the nations would look unto Israel and see the wisdom of God, right? That's part of why we are to be obedient to the Holy Scriptures and not according to the ways of the world. But primarily we do that because we humble ourselves before the Lord God. Because we understand that the Lord God is the one to whom we owe obedience. Now again, remember what all the Pharisees and stuff said at the calling of Matthew. Why do you go and sit with sinners? Right? What did they say in Zacchaeus? Why are you going to the sinner's house? And of course, Jesus understood something about Matthew and about Zacchaeus that the world didn't know and didn't understand. Yes, they were sinners, but who did Zacchaeus and Matthew belong to? Right? They belonged to the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? They were members of his flock. They were members of his kingdom. And he sought to instruct them on what it means to be a disciple in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, at its base, being a disciple means being a follower of Jesus. And it doesn't mean being a follower of Jesus on Sundays. Right? We know lots of people who are very good Christians for an hour on Sunday morning. But that's kind of the extent of their Christian life. Right? They, they come and they get their, their grace infusion uh, for an hour on Sunday and that's it. That's all they think they need. But again, what is the witness of the Bible? The Bible is, is that we are a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ seven days a week. That everything in our lives is under the captive word of the living God. And so we have to, as Christians, organize everything that we do by what God has declared to be right and holy. And that's, again, really at the base of what we see in these calling stories of the disciples. Like when Matthew, when, when Peter, in our passage today... When the Lord Jesus calls him, they immediately left their nets and followed him. And notice again what James and John does, right? He says something a little bit different there. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now, doesn't the fifth commandment tell us we're supposed to honor our father and our mother? Well, here's James and John leaving their father in the lurch. Right? Somebody's going to have to put the nets away. Yeah, I remember as a little kid, I, one of the things that always bothered me about this passage was is that they kind of just left the boats and the nets there. And all I could think about was my dad telling me to go and clean things up. And they just kind of left things there. But again, the, the purpose here is not, so, is not in, uh, you know, antagonistic towards the fifth commandment, but it's actually, of course, fulfilling the fifth commandment. Because what does it mean to honor your father and your mother? Who is our father and who is our mother? Jesus, we'll, we'll talk about that later on. Our father and our mother is who? They who do and love the word of the Lord our God. Those who rest and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the testimony that we have here and as we close this morning, as we think about what Jesus again is calling us unto as his disciples, is we, is are we willing? To leave our nets and follow him. 
Are we willing to throw aside all the idols of this age and be obedient unto his word? Are we willing to go whole hog, as they say? Because we can't just cut a little piece of a little, little part of the pig off and you know, ride the rest home. Right? You can't just be a little bit Christian. You're either believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, or you're not. And that is one of the great sins of our age. We think we can have our cake and eat it too. We think we can say Jesus things with our lips and live like pagans. And that's the call that we have this morning. And as we leave here, I want to challenge you with that. Examine your hearts and your lives. Cast out those things that are keeping you from Jesus. Be obedient unto his word. Again, not as a means to salvation. You're not going to get yourself a bigger mansion. Right? That's not the purpose of being obedient to the law of God. But the purpose, as we see here, is to follow Jesus. Because remember what Peter says uh, to Jesus in John chapter 6. After everybody else leaves. Jesus, where are we going to go? You alone have the words of eternal life. And is that the testimony of our hearts? Is that what we say when we see people leaving Jesus because they don't like what he says? Because we don't, they don't like the law of God. Do we kind of you know, slightly walk away too? Because again, the testimony is clear. Jesus Christ alone is the answer of salvation. Jesus Christ alone is the place of hope and of comfort. And of a place where we can hear those sweet words. Do not be afraid. For I am with you. For I have called you out of darkness. Into the light of my gospel truth. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks again. That you are the God of truth and the God of, uh, of life. And dear God, as we think about the nature of the lives that you've given us to live as, as disciples. Dear God, may you encourage us through the Holy Spirit. Give us the strength and give us, again, the witness to cast aside the idols, uh, cast aside the false teaching and the false philosophies that are so prominent today. That we may submit all things unto you. For you are our hope and our peace. And you are the comfort of your grace. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us now stand as we sing our closing uh, uh, Bible song, Bible song 264. Let us stand as we begin we sing from our green uh, Bible song book, number 264, Prayer for the Peace of the Church from Psalm 122. Let us stand and sing together. Uh, we're going to sing uh, verses 1, 4, and 5.
as we continue to seek the glory of the Lord in all that we do, as we come before him and receive the benediction today. Again, let us come, let us confess our sins, let us repent, and let us love the Lord our God, for he alone is the hope of salvation. You can hear the benediction from the book of Titus, chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.